Hello, John. It's great to have you here today. Hi, Claudia. Thanks for the chance to be here. Talk to all your supporters. Yes. <laughs> and um, so today I'm calling in from Wurundjeri country and my name is Claudia Galwa and I'm the coordinator at Friends of the Earth Sustainable Cities campaign. And we're here with John Stone from Melbourne Uni. Would you like to introduce yourself, John? Yeah, um, and I'm on Wurundjeri country too, just perhaps on the other side of Mary Creek where we're welcoming back the Kingfisher for the cycle of the seasons here. So yeah, good to be here. Oh, that's great. Um, well, it's really fantastic to have you here today to chat to everyone about Melbourne Metro too. So this week, if you haven't heard, we're running a fundraiser to continue the campaign to fight for this integral next step for Melbourne's public transport system. So Melbourne Metro 2 is a um, rail tunnel that would go from Clifton Hill to Newport via the city loop. And it would really create a, a crucial connection between the north and the west of Melbourne, as well as increasing capacity across the whole network. So we'll hear a little bit about more, a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but first of all, I'll explain a little bit about the fundraiser. So Basically, Sustainable Cities is a community-led campaign, and our main aim is to push back against major toll roads and divert that money towards sustainable transport options. So this week, we're organising a bit of a decentralised fun walk. So everyone who would like to get involved is welcome to go for a walk in their local neighbourhood, take a selfie, and then post that on social media with the hashtag build mm2 and you can tag sustainable cities at we sustain cities and basically um, folks will be doing this walk in their own time so that it's COVID safe so we won't be having a big group together but um, everyone can just go in their own time with a friend or two and just make sure that you're still following the um, COVID rules wearing your mask and staying 1.5 meters away and we'll be raising money to help ensure we can keep this community campaign going. So we're one of the only grassroots community campaigns in Melbourne who are um, fighting for sustainable public transport and particularly the Melbourne Metro too. And uh, we, we often say that we run on the smell of an old muesli bar wrapper, which we don't run on the smell of an old oily rag as some others may because it's too carb intensive. So. You know, we should be really moving towards zero waste, actually. But um, yeah, basically, um, we do really, um, we really love getting support from um, our uh, from everyone in the community who um, likes likes the work that we do, and we really appreciate that. So, if you can do chip in, so we can keep doing this really fantastic work. So we might, um, I might throw it back to you, John, and maybe we could talk a little about the Melbourne Metro 2 and why it's an integral part of infrastructure that we really need for, for Melbourne as part of this um, recovery from COVID. Well, people will be aware of Melbourne Metro 1, which is the tunnels that are going in now between Footscray and uh, South Yarra. And that's providing a really important connection for people from the northwest to the southeast suburbs. And what we need to complement that is a connection from the southwest, the hugely growing suburbs and around Werribee, up to the, the northeast and to expand the capacity of the rail system in the northeast as an alternative to the uh, incredibly awful northeast link freeway proposal, the tollway proposal, which would put 20 lanes on the eastern freeway and pour traffic into the inner suburbs. So COVID gives us a chance to stop and rethink our infrastructure priorities and move away from those which lock in a carbon intensive future, which lock in car transport. So uh, the, the alternative to that is the, the Melbourne Metro 2, the tunnel you described from Cliff to Hill to to Newport and gi giving us in the inner city a whole lot of new options getting from Clifton Hill through to the university through to Carlton and beyond and also giving the people who live further out more options to, to travel around Melbourne and that's going to be really important in a uh, carbon constrained future we have to get away from from car travel because and we also have to get away from single occupancy cars however they're um, they're powered a lot of 
excitement about the potential of electric vehicles, but if we look at the total energy use of, of, of a fleet of energy electric vehicles across Melbourne, if we dumped all our petrol cars, replaced them with electric cars, that the carbon intensity of that single transition would be huge, let alone the ongoing problems of running a, 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 a transport system with all these single occupancy vehicles, however you power it. Yeah, we... absolutely. Yeah, I think um, I was I was reading the other day that, you know, like obviously, even if you have an electric car or, you know, a, a self-driving car, it still takes up the same amount of space as the cars that we're using now. And in a lot of cities around the world, 30 to 60 percent of urban all urban areas are taken up just by cars or car infrastructure. So car parks, freeways and cars themselves. And it's just ridiculous to think about what we could do with that space if we didn't if cars weren't such a big thing you know yeah exactly and i mean just to finish the, the uh, climate argument you know those cars the single occupancy vehicles it caused the sprawl which encouraged the sprawl which takes up valuable agricultural land and the the carbon footprint that that, that creates is huge so you're putting that bitumen over large areas of farmland is is a bad carbon move as well and you're absolutely right uh, even if we don't look at um, climate which we, we have to look at that front and center but when we think about a future for a city most people at some point in their lives will or have been dependent on alternatives to the car you young people older people people with disabilities people without the economic potential to have two or three or four cars in the household all that means everybody at some stage in their life needs an alternative to the car so those alternatives have to be built at a standard which allows more people to leave their cars at home or not to have a car and that's why Melbourne Metro 2 is so important because it it's the backbone of the new system it's not sufficient on its own we have to get the crosstown connections we have to get the electric buses running fast and frequently across the suburbs so we can get to these new railways and we can get to all the different things we need in our day as we come out of this COVID time so that's the the important thing to remember is that a, a climate safe and a, a, a I guess justice uh, yeah, as well. Yeah, just, yeah, it's a it's a justice issue. Justice it's issue. A, absolutely, and it's a it's an issue of of what sort of city we want. Uh, if can everybody get to all the things that they need and love about living in a city? And if you don't have a good public transport system as the basis for that, and then support that with active transport, with cycling and walking, then you have neither a climate future or a just future for the city and um, and your work is so central to helping us understand that those are the choices that we're making in, as we come out of COVID. Yeah absolutely thank you yeah I think it is it is really important work to be doing because I think that there is still such a big focus on the car and we are seeing those new developments um, spread out across Melbourne and into the outer outer suburbs and it's it's really um, unfortunate that a lot of people out there don't have any access to public transport at all and mm. as you said not everyone can afford more than one car some people can't even afford one car so it is about it's about mobility justice and it's about making sure that everyone is able to access school work going to see friends and all of that kind of stuff and, and we I guess we've, we've, we know from now how important that is we've just yeah. experienced almost yeah, a whole we... year of, of not having that ability yeah and, um, and some people have don't have that ability i didn't have that ability you know the, like, the end of last year when many of us did and we we all know its absence now we all know what we have to do to to make sure we redress that balance in the future yeah absolutely i think that was a really big eye opener for a lot of people and um we we were working with the disability resources center earlier this year as well to really highlight that fact that a lot of people who are living with disabilities have never had access to public transport um, a lot of the time because so much of our transport is not accessible and um, 
I think everyone has almost had a little bit of a taste of that this year. Obviously, not the, it's not the same, but I think, you know, we've all had a taste of that isolation and how hard it can be when you don't have the ability to get where you want to go. Yeah, um, that's, yeah, it's really important that we start thinking with that sense of compassion as we rebuild after COVID rather than, well, what do I need right now? But what what does what does everybody need? And that's what planning is supposed to be about is to, you know, to iron out those um, inequalities in the system. And that's yeah. why we need a, a really good um, public transport system. And a lot of people think that it's not possible in, in Melbourne. We tell ourselves that we're so low density and we've scattered things so much that it's un impossible to fix. But the work that we do at Melbourne University, the work people do over the, around the world shows that you can have much better public transport in the city we have at the moment. We don't have to knock it all down and rebuild it, but we do have to get those decisions about where the destinations are. That's the most important thing, collecting the destinations in places where people can get to easily by public transport. So scattering schools, hospitals, jobs in the suburbs is the, the danger that we have to uh, fight against. And, and that's why uh, some of the, the plans for suburban development are, are good and some of them uh, have have real problems mm, yeah that's really interesting so are you saying that it's better to not scatter around schools and hospitals and for people to come into a central spot yeah yeah it's yeah. at the at the moment everything's scattered so mm. where we live is spreading out and where we want to go is spreading out and that results in a very difficult situation for everybody but Many people say, well, we've scattered out where we live so much that we're, there's no way of fixing it. But actually, most of the work around the world shows that if you bring, not necessarily all the way to the centre of the city, but to nodes within the city, and the Plan mm -hmm. Melbourne has all this um, rhetoric and, and a good analysis about you know, the 20-minute city where you try and make sure that many things that people need are close to home. And as we you know, work from home as some of us are lucky enough to be able to do or as we you know we, we find a, a new way of organizing the city that centralizing of of destinations you know, the local centers are going to be so much more important not just for getting your coffee but for getting many other services that you that you need so that's where the, the focus needs to be and we've got the the tools in our planning system to do that but mm -hmm. the problem is that our planning system has always been um, running in parallel with a ro huge road building agenda and so those things are incompatible but that contradiction is never drawn out in, you know, and that's the, what's really important in community work is having that conversation with people to understand the planning goals of of 20 minute cities and the the contradictions with the the road building agenda and so uh, you know, melbourne has been shaped by that schizophrenia for uh, 40 50 years and, th and that's really the thing that we have to challenge yeah, absolutely. And it's it just is baffling to me the fact that, you know, we've got the $16 billion Northeast Link, which is in its kind of beginning stages, potentially, yeah, potentially going ahead. And then also the Westgate Tunnel. It just feels like at a time when the climate crisis, we're already seeing huge bushfires, heat waves and coastal erosion in Victoria, let alone other parts of the world. It just feels like it's such... Uh, it just feels like it's so out of line with the trajectory we need to be going in, which is reducing those emissions. And I think it's good to remember as well that, um, you know, transport is the second biggest and fastest growing contributor to emissions in Victoria and Australia and in lots of parts of, of lots of places around the world. And if we're going to rein in emissions, like transport is a huge, huge sector that we need to be really transitioning towards more sustainable transport. Yeah, exactly, Claudia. And uh, that's the, the thing where we do see the beginnings and the accelerating uh, moves on you know, energy generation you know, and the work of Friends of the Earth over the years has been pivotal to that, that change. And that's, that's so exciting, but it does leave us looking at the next biggest thing, which is transport. And at, at the moment, we don't have that consensus in uh, 
in government anywhere. We don't, you know, see anywhere that's actually in Australia that's actually sort of building climate friendly transport systems. You can see it in other parts of the world. There's glimmers of it in, uh, in cities like Vancouver. They're, they're it's particularly, and I'd really encourage people to look at recent moves in, in Vancouver where the government has actually accelerated their public transport program explicitly on a climate agenda. And, and that's meant that, that the changes are happening much, much faster than many people in Vancouver thought was possible. And, you know, and in Europe, that's also the case. So there's models there, but they're, they're just quite fledgling compared to the, the successes that we've been able to have in in renewable energy and so on so that's really the challenge for us in, in from from now or it was the challenge we faced as we breathed all that bushfire smoke back in in the summer yeah absolutely and i think it's really interesting to point out as well that idea about induced demand so if you build more toll roads and big roads it really encourages more people to drive but if you build public transport that's fast and um, reliable and safe and comfortable much more people are more likely to get on public transport as well and that shift is a lot easier when it is a viable option for people to to go to yeah that's true and because you know, for most people they haven't experienced good public transport certainly they haven't experienced in the suburbs they might think okay i can get to the football on Friday evening or something with the, the train, but for most of the rest of my life, it doesn't help. And and that's the experience that we've had. And so that's why we need some demonstrations of how these things can, can work to, to build people's support. Otherwise, the politics just goes round in a circle that nobody ever feels that there's a way to get out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for talking to us today. Um, I'll just reiterate to everyone that we are speaking today about the Melbourne Metro 2 rail tunnel. So um, it's a community campaign that we're focusing on um, called Sustainable Cities. And we this week we have a fundraiser to help keep the campaign going and to help keep pushing for sustainable public transport like the Melbourne Metro 2 rail tunnel. So you can donate at the link in this live stream. And I'd just like to say a huge thank you to John Stone, who's a senior lecturer in transport planning at the University of Melbourne for joining us here today. And um, yeah, we'll speak again soon, hopefully. Great, thanks and good. Keep up the great work, Claudia. Thank you, bye. Bye.